Well, I don't want to multiply examples of what natural selection has done to humans, because part of my argument is that it may have stopped doing things to us. But let me just tell you about one, because it just shows how potent um, selection can be and how much we're really beginning to understand it. It turns on, perhaps, the most familiar of all the <coughs> variants in humans, which is the variation in skin color across the globe. And there's a striking variation in skin color, of course, as we all know, uh, both north and south of the equator, that people closest to the equator tend in general to have much darker skins than people far away in the, the equator, and that's particularly true in the northern hemisphere, where populations go much further north, and it went much further north um, longer ago than in the south. Now, Humans really only got out of, into, into much of the Northern Hemisphere within the last 70 or 80,000 years. So this is really quite a, a recent pattern of evolution. We know a lot about its genetics now. Uh, we know, and indeed it's been found, it's a classic example of what genetics can do. Genetics is the only science to have accelerated by going into reverse. What we used to do was to find something in humans or some other creature and try to work out from what that something was, perhaps a disease like cystic fibrosis, try to work out what the gene might be, um, what the protein it made might do, indeed perhaps where the gene might be located. Now we do things quite differently. Um, we, actually can, we can actually look at DNA and infer what the genes do and we can find genes in one species and look for them very quickly in another one. And skin color, human skin color is a classic of that. Here's the uh, creature which gave us the key to human skin color. It's a fish called the zebra fish, widely used in developmental biology. And just look at the two top um, examples there. The top is a, what, what is a, is a wild type, um, a normal zebra fish, with lots of dark stripes filled with a pigment called melanin. Below it is a thing called the golden zebra fish, in which the, stri the melanin has really no longer being made. The stripes are there physically, but there's not much melanin in there. And the golden fish is much used by developmental biologists as they watch the shift from egg to adult, because you can actually see through the embryo as it develops. Well, it didn't take long with classic genetics to find where the mutation in the fish was, and it took only a millisecond to put it in the huge DNA database that we now have on humans and find the same gene in humans, and we found the same gene in humans and very quickly it became clear that there were two different versions across the world. Let's just compare, at the moment, and I'll come back to the rest of the world in a moment, let's compare Africa and Europe. 99% of all Africans, of southern Africa, in the southern part of Africa, Africa, have got one variant of that particular um, gene, and 99% or more of all Europeans have got another variant. They differ in only one place in the protein, one amino acid, and this is the most structurally diverse, most structurally varied gene that we know of in the human population. And this gene accounts for quite a lot of the difference in color between Africans and Europeans. And we know an awful lot about it, the way it works, but we don't really have to worry about um, very much more than that. There's an interesting spin on the tail. Um, uh, it's pretty clear that this gene is new. It's pretty clear, for example, that the people who painted the cave paintings in Lascaux were probably black. Um, uh, it may well be that the very first Britons who got to Britain after the Ice Age may well have been black. Um, but the gene has spread very quickly, probably, since then in Northern Europe. A, the spin is, if you look over into China and Japan, um, they've got the African version of the gene but they don't have black skins. And actually what's happened there is that the Chinese and the Japanese have evolved their light-colored skins using a different gene, a different break in the melanin path pathway, a different uh, piece of damage in the factory that makes that dark pigment, uh, so they're light. So there have been at least two, and we now think maybe more than two, separate origins of light skin color within the rather recent past. And the speed at which this has happened suggests that it's really been quite important. Well, why, why should it be? Well, I guess m many of us will know why it is. It has everything, almost everything, almost everything we know about black skin is good. Almost everything we know. It protects against skin cancer. It protects against um, the destruction of circulating antibodies, which certainly happens if you lie in the sun. Your immune system is quite severely compromised um, as the antibodies are exposed to ultraviolet. It protects against the destruction of folic acid, which is a vitamin which is uh, very useful, very valuable to pregnant women. Um, it means the skin ages less quickly. If almost everything we know about black skin is good. So why do so many people in the world not have black skin? It turns on another vitamin, vitamin D, and vitamin D 
um, is, of course, the anti-rickets vitamin. If you don't have um, vitamin D, you're in danger of having uh, this soft bone disease that's, known, that's called rickets. And here's a picture of a, a child with rickets. And rickets was once absolutely common. It, I'm sure it was in, in London in the 19th century and before. If you look at the graves of children, you find that nearly all of them had the soft bone disease rickets. The, the weather was, was as it still is, terrible. Um, people, the, the sky was as it is less, smoky, and people blocked up their windows because they had to pay tax according to the number of windows they had. So that rickets was absolutely, um, was, was common. And rickets actually is, uh, doesn't just damage your bones, it damages your liver, it leads to an increase in uh, shortage of vitamin D, damages your liver, leads to an increase in cancer. There's a recent theory actually of the very poor health in Scotland, which is very genuine, and having spent 10 years in Scotland as a student, I simply blamed it on the drink. Um, it, uh, there's a theory actually it may have a lot to do with the shortage of vitamin D because of the shortage of sunlight up there. People tend to think that rickets has gone away, but it certainly hasn't. Rickets is still common. It's the commonest, the second commonest non-communicable disease of children worldwide. And it's particularly common among um, people with dark skin living away from their native continents near the equator. Here's a picture of the amount of plasma vitamin D in African Americans and European Americans throughout the year. And you can see that throughout the year, uh, European Americans have more than twice as much vitamin D as African Americans. And African Americans, most African Americans, uh, are below the safe levels of vitamin D. And there are many people in that group. For example, in Greece, many elderly ladies have that problem because either they don't go out or they do go out, but they're dressed in completely swathed in black. In Britain, there are major problems among the Islamic community among the girls in particular because they, very, they cover themselves and have no sunlight. So this really is quite a powerful agent of natural selection. And any mutation that lightened the skin would be favored. And it's pretty clear that light skin was favored because of the ability to make vitamin D in those individuals in places with almost no sunshine. Um, and the figures are now quite impressive. If you were to stand outside, and I don't recommend it in the sunlight today, with only your torso exposed for 10 minutes, that, and if you had light skin, that would make enough vitamin D to allow you to stay healthy. So the, the, the effect is powerful. This vitamin D theory has recently also ex um, explained perhaps the most important question in human population genetics, which is, of course, the origin of the blonde. Um, Here's an Australian person with that rather rare mutation. Here's a British equivalent. Um, <laughs> this is Boris Johnson, the, the buffoon Boris, who's the mayor of London. Both of these have this rather rare appearance of having very light colored skin and, uh, and very, uh, very light colored hair and very pale skin. And there are people with even paler skins and red hair. Now, the interesting thing about the blonde is before people began to move around the globe, this particular mutation was actually only, uh, we know a lot about the genetics of it now. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but there are particular genes which you've got certain variants of it shown in, re shown in uh, darker there. They give you either red hair or blonde hair, also give you sensitivity to sun and blue eyes. Um, these people were really rather rare until recently, and all of them were found within about a few hundred kilometers or a thousand kilometers of Copenhagen. This is the instance of light hair in Europe, from almost zero to really up to 80% or so in Scandinavia. So why should that be? It actually turns on, the, once again, the spread of farming. Farming, of course, began in the Middle East about 10,000 years ago, uh, began with grain crops, which spread rapidly. And all over the world, except in one part of the world, you can only grow grain crops um, in a place with a relatively warm and sunny spring, because they need, um, they need the, uh, the warmth of the sun in order to germinate. And so that uh, you can't grow grain, for example, in southern Russia, uh, because the, uh, the springs are not warm enough, even though the summers are hot. The exception to that, the exception to that is Britain and Western Europe. Britain and Western Europe have warm springs, albeit cloudy, because of the Gulf Stream. We don't see the sun, but most of the time we say we stay warm. So the people, as farming spread, could spread in large numbers with farming. And farming didn't arrive until really not very long ago. It's a pretty awful slide. But what it shows is that it got, farming got into England about 5,000 years ago, into Scotland about 3,500 years ago, and into Scandinavia about 2,000 years ago. And if you had a grain-based diet, as the early farmers did, and you lived in this um, cloudy and uh, dull environment in, Western, in Northwest Europe, you really suffered when it came to vitamin D deficiency and rickets. So any new mutation, which even further lightened one's skin, 
blonde hair and very pale skin, let's say, was strongly favoured and spread. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is where blondes came from, if anybody should ask you. But the interesting thing is that all that has probably happened within the last two and a half thousand years, which is, in evolutionary terms, almost nothing, just a couple of hundred human generations. So natural selection can work. As a, as a, and it works on death. Uh, the, those diagrams of gene frequency changes, uh, every one of them has got a tragedy or millions of tragedies in it because the evolution of blondes involved the death, through rickets, of many millions of children who did not have the appropriate genetic change. Uh, some survived and some did not. There were real differences in their prospects depending on what genes they carried. Plenty of raw material for natural selection. Well, I think that's at least for the time being, and at least in the developed world, that's really changed. I start my um, introductory genetics lecture uh, at UCL by telling the students, and you might like to do it yourselves, to look at the person to their left and the person to their right. And this being the first lecture, they, uh, they actually obey what I tell them, but the last time they do it. Um, and uh, they'll do this in a rather bemused fashion. And I say, two, I say reasonably accurately, I say two out of every three of you will die for reasons connected with the genes you carry. And they look a bit glum at that, but it's true, because cancer, heart disease, diabetes, all these things have a strong genetic component. But then I say, um, cheer up. If I'd be giving this lecture in Shakespeare's time, two out of every three of you would be dead already. And that's actually true. If you look at the incidence um, of death in 1600, uh, roughly speaking Shakespeare's time, two-thirds of English babies were died dead before they were 21. In Darwin's birth time, 1800 or so, just a little bit more than half. And nowadays, 98, 99% of all babies um, in the developed world, of course, including Australia, including Japan, um, uh, much of China, last until they're 21 years old. Well, that's, that's great, but what it means is there are no differences. Plenty of those babies who died listening to Hamlet, or they, while their parents were listening to Hamlet, died for genetic reasons. They died because they could not resist cholera, I'd say. They may have died of rickets, uh, may have died of starvation, and they couldn't cope with that. Now we all stay alive. So the raw material of selection, which is difference, has gone away. Um, so there can be no natural selection on survival. However, natural selection is uh, a two, it's a bit like the driving test, it's a two-part exam. You can, we've all passed the first paper by definition because we're all, at least we are, at least we hope we're all still alive, okay? But many of us, myself, I'm sorry to say included, have failed the second paper because we have no children. So in order to pass the uh, natural selection exam, you must pass the survival test and the fertility test, or the fecundity test, as it's called. And uh, there are plenty of differences there, too. And historically, um, some of those were very big. They're much bigger for males than for females because the number of children that a woman can have is limited by the simple facts of biology. Uh, the Guinness Book of Records, that absolute um, center of scientific, uh, dependable scientific information, has one woman who claims to have had 37 children, which seems a lot, but it's, I suppose it's just about possible. Um, that's nothing, I can assure you. Um, here's a picture of a young family uh, where are we? On holiday in Sweden, taken in the 1960s, that charming young lad with a red circle around his head is Osama bin Laden. Um, and this is a picture of him on a holiday with his half-brothers and half-sisters in Sweden. Okay? And Mohammed bin Laden, who's his father, had 22 wives and 53 children. And in the year of Osama's own birth, he had six children. Uh, Osama had, himself had, last time they were counted, he had five wives and 22 children. Um, but that's nothing. If you go back into history, you find that's really very common. Uh, I dug out a guy called uh, Moulay Ismail the Cruel of Morocco, who lived in the 18th century in a little mountain kingdom in the north of Morocco, and he admitted, rather grudgingly, to having had 888 children. Um, Many people accuse him of having had more, but he denied all knowledge of the other 200 or so. Um, and he may well have done. And of course, there was more than one Mrs. Moulay Ismail the Cruel. There may have been 100, maybe more. If there were 100 Mrs. Moulays, there were 99 uh, Mr. Glums out there who didn't have a wife, didn't have any children at all, so that there was massive variation in male mating success. Um, and that seems to have been true for much of history. I can give many examples of it, but one of the joys of being male is that you have a Y chromosome, okay? And the Y chromosome get, tells you the history of the male rather than the female lineage. Um, as I often point out, the Y chromosome um, of men and chimps 
of humans and chimps has, 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 has diverged much more than the X chromosome has, and women having two Xs are hence genetically closer to chimps than men are. Um, uh, discuss, as they say. Um, but from our point of view, what's interesting is that you can use the Y chromosome to look at the pattern of male reproductive success. This has been done in many parts of the world, and what you often find, and I'll give you an example from Ireland here. In some places, for example, in much of mainland Britain, and I'm sure in most of Australia, most of the newly settled parts of the world, everybody in this room has got his more or less unique version of the Y chromosome. There's lots and lots of diversity in the Y chromosome. But in some places that isn't true. And here's the pattern that takes place in Ireland. And you can see that in Northwest Ireland, um, up to one male in six has one particular version of the Y chromosome, one that's very slightly changed from it. And nearly all of those males belong to one of half a dozen families with particular surnames, all of whom play, uh, claim descent from the High Kings of Ireland. And the High Kings of Ireland, who ruled Ireland for many hundreds of years, um, were, were basically warlords, as of course there were warlords all over Europe at that time. Uh, they had lots of kids. Um, many of them, uh, all of them, traced their ancestry to a guy called Neil of the Nine Hostages. Neil once took St. David hostage, so he was a really effective hostage taker. And Neil of the Nine Hostages, like Mullah Ismail, is supposed to have had hundreds of children. And that, that historic event is still manifest in the genes of the modern Irish population. So there were massive differences in reproductive success, some of which may again have been raw material for natural selection. And once again, those differences have gone away. Here we have the picture of fertility in Europe over the last um, century and more. The mean number of children has gone down, but that's not what I'm going to concentrate on. I'm going to concentrate on the variability in the number of children. And you can see that as in 1920 or in 1880, there was a huge spread um, over different uh, places um, and populations in the number of children that people had. By the year 2000, uh, that's gone, it's almost disappeared. Okay? And now, all over the developed world, most people have zero, one, two, three, four, perhaps five, perhaps eight children, very rarely. Nobody has 888. So once again, the raw material difference of natural selection has disappeared. Now, you can put those two figures together, um, differences in survival and differences in reproductive success, and you come up with a statistic that's called the opportunity for natural selection. And if you plug those into the historical figures that we know about, more than 90% of the opportunity for natural selection to work in humans has come to a stop at least for the time being, and at least in the developed world. So I'm pretty confident of the statement that Darwin's central mechanism, natural selection in humans, that too has lost much of its power. Well, let me turn finally and rather briefly to the third question about, um, about um, change. Evolution at random, evolution in small populations. And Darwin, of course, uh, Darwin didn't actually do much in the Galapagos. It's much talked about, but he only spent five weeks there. He spent longer in Australia than in the Galapagos. Um, and uh, he made a few vague notes about change. But he became very interested in island populations later in his life. And he noted that many species, unique species, were found on islands, as of course we now know. If you're a bird watcher, you know that every uh, South Pacific island tends to have many endemic birds of its own. And that's because island populations are insulated from being swamped and overwhelmed by surrounding populations that may be responding to different kinds of evolutionary force. And uh, once upon a time, hu most humans lived in islands, a metaphorical and sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes uh, um, real islands. Um, if you look, for example, and that's often manifested in the genes, all of us passed through a tiny bottleneck of life on an island as our ancestors, nearly all of us, as our ancestors emerged from Africa. If you draw a family tree of the human race, based on one particular kind of DNA, and I'll talk you through this a little bit, um, this is a family tree of the human race, but, but based on what's called mitochondrial DNA. Uh, where are we? Blah, blah. And it's just a tree, tree of relatedness. Okay, you can see that we split really into two groups of people, one of which are the Khoisan, the Bushmen, and another African group. Another is the rest of Africa, and this tiny group here is the rest of the world. So what that tells us is that all the genes of the rest of the world, and that's us, okay, uh, descend from a very, very small group of, of people, perhaps as, 
few as a hundred or so who emerged from Africa and lived as an isolated group perhaps a hundreds or thousands of years. And that accidental change, that random sampling of genes in a tiny isolated population had a major effect on the evolutionary um, history of the human race. And that process in some places went on until very recently. The classic place where it went on, and we see it, is in Finland. Here's a picture I took of a, a young girl about 10 years ago, more now, 15 years ago, who's got a rather very unpleasant disease that's called variant late infantile neurolipofuscoidosis, and it's not going to be in the exam, as I'm constantly asked. Um, and she's got two copies of this particular gene, and she uh, really has severe problems because this is a, uh, a bit like, in some ways, a bit like Tay-Sachs disease. It leads to a disappearance and destruction of the nervous system, and unfortunately this young girl by now will certainly have passed away. That's her father. Um, this gene, together with at least 30 others, is only found in Finland. And if you look in Finland, it's only one found in one small part of Finland. And Finland basically is or was a few islands of people in a sea of trees. Finland has an extraordinarily complete set of family records, which are kept by the Lutheran Church. And what Finns have been able to do is make pedigrees of all these families. And it turns out that if you take that young girl, in fact is this young lady here, uh, and you trace her back through the pedigree and each line um, is a generation, the vertical lines are the family lines, squares are males and circles are females, you can see that all those cases trace back to the same ancestor um, who lived probably in the 1680s and there's one other case which may well trace back to him too um, where we, uh, where we uh, uh, haven't been able to make the link. And that ancestor probably carried a single copy of the gene, he knew nothing about it, it passed through separate um, paths through history in that small inbred population until it came together and those two related parents, although they didn't know they were related, married and their child inherited two copies of the gene. Now that pattern of marrying a relative was until recently really very common because actually people had no choice. People lived in small isolated communities and married the girl or the boy next door because there was no alternative. And cousin marriage in particular, um, again, until recently, was really, was really, quite, was really quite common. Um, okay? um, people really had no choice. But now, of course, they've begun to move. And people have begun to move, obviously, in Australia, enormously so. But even in most places where people have not emigrated, there's been a huge amount of movement. And one of the ways you can study that movement is by the movement of surnames. Darwin was the first person to notice that. Another genius piece of work by Darwin. He realized that if you wanted to ask how often did people marry their relatives, all you had to do was to ask how often does somebody marry somebody with the same surname as themselves. That doesn't work very well with a common name like with mine, Jones, but it works very well with a rare name like Darwin or the people I'm staying with are called McCrick. Um, okay, here's the pattern of Jones in 1881, and you'll see that we were carefully kept behind the separation fence at the, west, at the Welsh border. Um, uh, I was born in the most purple part of Wales, uh, the, the Jonesiest part of Wales, and yet um, by 1998 we'd escaped and we managed to spread all the way down across England, and to really quite common, and I'm told that some of us have even made our way to Sydney. And what that means, of course, is that the human population is beginning to become genetically much more open than it was. And that's largely because it's much more abundant than it was. We're really unusual as primates, as mammals. You could actually make a, a, a line that fits the abundance of particular wild, wild mammals, how common they are to their body size. And it's a bit unsurprising, really. It proves that there are more mice than there are elephants, okay? Well, I, I guess we knew that. But you can put humans on that line. Every mammal fits on that line apart from one, and that's us, that's humans. And we're 10,000 times more abundant than we ought to be if we were simply wild primates. The natural population of the world is not um, uh, 6 billion um, as it now is. It should be something like the population of Glasgow in Scotland or the population of Newcastle north of Sydney, something like half a million. That's the natural population of the world. And in a population where the world is filled by half a million people, you do not meet many potential partners. Every one of you on your way to this lecture saw many more people than the average hunter-gatherer through human history would have seen in his or her lifetime. 
And uh, under those circumstances, of course, you have a far greater choice of mates than previously you had. And as a result, the population is becoming very much more um, wider, very much more outbred than it ever was. So no longer are people marrying their mates, no longer are people living in small populations, so no longer is the opportunity for random change of the kind that we see on islands or through population bottlenecks of the kind we saw in Finland. Now you can illustrate that in many ways. One of the interesting ways is to look at one particular population um, you know, who are African Americans. Here's a, a very dubious organization called 23andMe, one of several such dubious organizations. And if you spit into a tube and send off your DNA, they will uh, allegedly, they claim, I think they probably do something with it, uh, they will look and scan that DNA and tell you that you will die on Tuesday the 14th of May 2064. Um, well, they won't tell you that. They'll, te they'll tell you, oh, we think your DNA tells you that you ought to stop smoking, that you should lose weight, take more exercise and have a healthy diet. And so you, so you think to yourself, that was $1,000 well spent. Um, and uh, they put it, put it in the back and look smug. But one of the interesting uh, aspects of 23andMe is their biggest clients by a long way are African Americans and African Americans understandably feel that their ancestry has been stolen from them okay and they don't know who their ancestors are here's a classic African American Colin Powell it's clear that he has many European ancestors and here's a uh, 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 illustration taken from 23andMe showing the genetic history of an African-American woman. 65%, two-thirds of her genes are of African origin, about a third are of European origin. Surprisingly, perhaps 7% are of Asian origin, but that includes Native Americans. And of course, Native Americans are the uh, direct, recent direct descendants of Asian populations. So a huge amount of mixing, okay? And in that mixed population, uh, which is uh, basically now a giant continent of humankind, there is no longer the opportunities for Darwin's third mechanism um, to take place for, ran for random change. In some ways, we've reunited Gondwana land. Okay, what we've done is certainly we're, we used to be scattered across the continents of the world. The continents haven't changed, but the continents haven't moved, but their inhabitants have. And we're no, now no longer on islands, physical or metaphorical, but we're on some global sexual continent. History, as somebody once said, is made in bed, but the beds are getting a lot closer together. Um, and the effect is really quite strong. In Britain, the stronger, and probably in Australia too, the strongest predictor of who you will marry, if you're a youngish person, is education level, okay? You are much more likely to marry somebody of the same educational level, high or low, um, as yourself, as somebody of a different education level. Uh, the, the introductory speaker mentioned that I was born in Aberystwyth. I once got a degree from there, and I made the most regrettable joke. My parents were there, and I said, I have a unique qualification to have a degree from the University of Wales of Aberystwyth because I was conceived on campus, which is completely true. I was conceived on campus and, <laughs> and they were married and they, uh, and they both had doctorates as it happened, but that's neither here nor there. So you're very much more like, if you want to know the best predictor of your potential mate, ask what class of degree they got, okay? A much weaker predictor in Britain is skin color. That's number five in the order. And in fact, there is almost free mating um, between people of, of Afro-Caribbean origin and people of European origin in Britain. I don't know what the situation is in Australia, but no doubt it's changing rapidly. So we are becoming one gigantic continent of DNA and no longer a series of separate islands. So to summarize, really, um, what that really tells us, I suppose, is that the most important event in human evolution was actually the, the invention of the bicycle. People could get on their bicycles or their 747s and travel around the world and mix their genes. So to summarize then, I think all three of Darwin's bits of raw material, the parts of his machine, mutation, natural selection, and random change in small populations, have lost much of their power. So if you're, wonder, if you're worried about what utopia is going to be like, you shouldn't be because you're living in it now. And if you're wondering where it is, I actually discovered its location. It's just south of Sydney. But as you'll see, this map is not valid for navigation. I will stop there. Thank you.